Okay, we started our recording. We had our prayer before we did that. Uh, welcome everybody to the chapter six discussion of crucifixion of the King of Glory. And um, let's do as we usually do, kind of go around the table, quote unquote, see if there's anything uh, that folks really want to make sure that we talk about or that, that they had strong impressions of, so we can make sure that we don't lose that um, and that we get to it sometime before we say good night. So did anybody have any specific things uh, that they wanted to talk about, anything that really struck them uh, during this, uh, in the reading of this relatively short chapter um, that they want to make sure we talk about? I see Marlene has her hand raised, but you're muted. Okay. Um, I had questions Good. coming up to this, but I think this chapter with some snippets here and there kind of answers my questions. Um, with uh, there's, it, it sounds like there were like animal sacrifices, like tons of them all the time yeah. going on. Yeah, like every and, day, many, many times a day. Yeah, I, and some days were like you know, 30 or whatever. So my question all along was, well, what happens with all the meat and the and, and the skins and everything? And some of that's been answered now. Um, they weren't. They didn't just all go to waste. They were no. utilized. Mm -hmm. They were given to the priests and such for their earnings, for their for their uh, the duties that they had to perform and all that. Um, now the burnt offerings are those like totally burnt to ashes so they're not utilizing yes. any yeah, so those, 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 those are not, but those i think if i recall correctly are cut up first and so they're skinned they were they were killed and skinned before they were burned okay. so the skins were saved but the the rest if i recall correctly were completely burned yes okay. so the question that marlene's asking for those who are here in the church with me uh is she she wasn't quite sure like what happens with all these animal sacrifices what happens to all the meat what happens to all of, all that all of that and that reading this chapter helped her to be able to kind of be mm -hmm. that. and so i was affirming to her that that's right they would divide the the thing and it would be given to the priests yeah and so this was one of the ways that the priests were um uh, were remunerated, remunerated, right? That they—that's how they were sort of paid in a way. Uh, was in, in by by the hides, by the animal flesh, and so on and so forth. Uh, that they ate, uh, that they could bring to the so on and so forth. And just do you like sheep or do you like goat? Uh, so <laughs> Paula just asked the question: Do I like sheep or do I like goat? Uh, actually, uh, I am happy with either one. Uh, just depends on the, on the situation but most of those sacrifices were not salted so i don't know if after they cooked it they could add salt or not I, that i don't know but they were not salted when they were cooked so and it's just so everybody knows lucy's here in case you haven't noticed it's important to 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 note that so she's she's ready to participate in the conversation oh lucia mm -hmm. so Mar marlene has another question go ahead it just just as a follow-up i'm assuming then that that this is the um uh, the ritual that they've done all these years and they still do when we're talking about kosher meats it has to be bled first is that you might so, understand that uh, that's these they'll yes. do mm -hmm. since the destruction of the temple the uh by the romans and then the further destruction by people scraping the gold and silver off of all the, the that was melted onto the rocks there's been no animal sacrifice at all for the jewish people so we're talking about a couple thousand years almost that they haven't been practicing this it can only be done in the temple now the temple was a tent of course at first and they used to carry that tent with them as they were in the desert uh, <laughs> and they did do the sacrifices there but of course, as as they grew, it was impossible to do it in a tent. And so about the year, we talked about the years, but anyway, when David brought the Ark of the Covenant, You're frozen.
I just texted him. Yeah, I saw that. Gosh, this worked better when he was up in the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> You're right. Oh. Oh, that's too bad. This is a new system, isn't it, Ken? <laughs> Um, we got a, the, the, the Wednesday before the festival, I believe mm -hmm. we were having all kinds of trouble and we got a new internet provider, um, in those few days, um, before the festival, cause we needed good internet cause that was how we were doing all the, you know, people paying for food and everything else. So, right. um, uh, but yeah, I, and it looked like he was a church, so. Yeah. Well, you're kind of away from the city, so I guess the connection is just bad over there. Um, I think we've got a, um, I thought he said we had a, um, like a satellite service, I mm. think. Because I think that interim one that was like super high speed, but not very reliable was, um, what do you say? Not uh, cable, it was the optical or fiber optic mm. connection um but uh huh. mm. <laughs> is he starting over ah there He's on mute now. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, we thought that we had uh, the connectivity issues settled at church. Apparently we didn't. Uh, but thankfully, Paula <laughs> has a hotspot that works. So that's great. Um, so what we were saying is that when, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem by David, then the animal sacrifices began on Mount Moriah. And there haven't been animal sacrifices uh, in the Jewish world since the time that the temple was destroyed. So hopefully that helped. Paula has a question here. I found that chapter, like, I don't know. I, I don't know if, well, in their um, hierarchy, it was definitely man-made. Mm -hmm. I mean, me, it's- Can people hear what she's saying or shall I repeat it? Mm -hmm. I can hear. You can hear what she's saying? Okay. Yes. Like. I mean, there was no hope for the Levites, for example, to to do something else, to change. Mm -hmm. So that I found a little strange. Um, and then the waste, the waste of the meat, it really bothered me. So I don't think much of the meat was wasted uh, because the priests ate the sacrifices. The only thing that we could kind of say was wasted was the burnt offerings, so also be burned completely. But the, uh, everything else was was consumed by the priests, so nothing nothing was wasted from that point of view. Because then I read that I don't know if there was because I'm in chapter fourteen, but um, that Harold, my goodness, he would just burn. I mean, sacrifice animals after animals, mm -hmm. insane. So yeah, so uh, eight hundred something. Yeah. So and he was a pagan, of course, not a not a Jew, but yes. Um, it was interesting that they noted, I thought at the beginning of the chapter, that she noted that essentially being a priest in the ancient world, whether it was pagan or Jewish, meant that you were essentially slaughtering animals. That was that was the um, yeah. that was the job essentially. So, and as far as the you know Levites couldn't become priests and priests couldn't become Levites and so on and so forth, I don't know if they even would think about it. Like it, it, it we look at it from our twenty first century eyes, where you know you choose what you want to do, you do what you want to do. But it like, wasn't probably very many generations ago, maybe three, four generations ago. That really wasn't the question. If you were born into uh, a winemaker's family, you were going to be a winemaker. That was it. Like it just wasn't a yeah. or a butcher's family. You were going to be a butcher. And so whether they thought about it that way or not, I don't know. They might have. They might have. But I, I just I, I don't know. Probably they were just like, yeah, that's just what it is. You know, I'm going to be a priest or I'm going to be a levite or I'm going to be whatever. 
So, okay, good. Anybody else want to uh, comment on anything they read that we want to make sure we cover? And then we'll kind of go through the chapter little by little. Okay, let's start to do that then. Um, so as, as I just mentioned, the main job of the priest was to sacrifice animals. Uh, and that's why Christian priests were called presbyters, because it has the the implication that you're not, that that's not what we do, which is true. We don't do that. There are no animal sacrifices. There are no blood sacrifices in Christianity. There is the bloodless sacrifice of Jesus Christ, uh, which continues in the liturgy at each liturgy, right? So, in fact, it's not allowed to have blood in the altar at all. Like, if somebody, if one of the boys cuts themselves while they're serving, they have to go out. Like if they can put on a band-aid and small fine, they can come back. But like if you're bleeding, bleeding, you cannot be in the altar at all. So it's very, it's completely opposite from the all previous concepts of a sacrifice, which were all attached to animal sacrifice in Christianity. So Paula was raising. So, her hand. and when I found out about this because I didn't know mm -hmm. about the blood mm -hmm. i just found out because one of my friends said oh i cannot come uh next sunday because for sure i'm gonna be on my period and uh -huh. i said and at first i was very mad i said I, I cannot believe that god doesn't allow women because i thought about the the muslims mm -hmm. a, a woman cannot pray because she's dirty uh -huh. and i said please do not tell me that my God is like this too. Uh -huh. I was gonna be very upset, but then she she explained it to me. I didn't know. Uh -huh. I didn't know. So the, the the prohibition about blood is in the is in the altar, and I think that that's a, an important uh, distinction that we have to have to make about this. Um, yeah. So anyway, we can we can talk about those things more, or we can talk about them where we don't, or we don't have to talk about them. But the uh, about women coming to church, there is no rule about that that women can't come to church. There's only I don't have that problem. Yeah, but it's it's only there are only two things that can't happen. It's to, to be baptized or to partake of Holy Communion. But about going to church, there is no yeah. prohibition about that, and I think it's important that we. Are very specific about that. We don't have to take on more than than the Lord gave us, except when it's Pascha, when everyone goes to communion, no matter what. Yeah. Well, on Pascha, mm -hmm. because you are. Okay, place. good. So, um, in any case, I think that the key point that I would like to make here is that every other concept of priesthood has to do with animal sacrifice in the entire world, except Christianity, which does not have to do with animal sacrifice at all. There's no animal sacrifice in Christianity at all. And I thought the footnote in page 50 was interesting. And of course, I don't have glasses, so it may be really interesting hypothetically. Uh, and we may not be able to read that. But we need to you want to borrow mine? Let's see. I might be able to do it. Let's see. OK, so it's, it's relatively straightforward. Christians never sacrificed animals. And for that reason, Christians did not initially call their religious leader a priest, but a presbyter. He, he presided over the bloodless sacrifice, the spiritual worship of the Lord. It's okay, I can't read it. Thank you. Okay, um, so then we start to go through, and I think very interestingly, uh, the details of the tribe of Levi, so, or Levi. There are 12 Jewish tribes, and everyone who is a Jew belongs to one of those tribes. Most people know the tribe that they belong to. Not all, but most know the tribe that they belong oh. to. There was a lost tribe, the tribe of Dan, which was lost sometime after the destruction of the temple. Uh, and they were interestingly found again in Africa. Uh, and they, there was a, a group there that had a very strong tradition that they were the, the tribe of Dan, uh, but they were not Semites, or they didn't seem to be Semites by the way that they looked. They looked like African people. Uh, and so for generations, the Jews refused to accept that they were the tr tribe of Dan. But now we have 23andMe, uh, and they did genetic testing on those people, and sure enough, that is the tribe of Dan. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, very, it's very, very interesting uh, that, that, that they are not lost anymore. Uh, so anyway, but it, each each Jewish person belongs to a certain tribe, and the they had specific jobs usually that were attached to those tribes, and the Levites especially had a special had special things that they did. There were there were priests, and Levites came from this 
this clan, this tribe. The priests mm -hmm. were direct descendants of Aaron, who was the first priest, the brother of Moses. Remember, Moses was not made the priest because he had a speech impediment. Uh, the tradition in the church is that he stuttered. And it was important for the priest to be able to speak clearly. And so that's why God chose his brother Aaron to be the priest, even though Moses was the leader. So it's a very interesting thing. Now, well, we don't get too excited about Aaron because, uh, you know, when Moses went up to get the, 12, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, then... Aaron was leading the people and building a, a golden calf. But in any case, yeah, that is why that. Uh, the priests drew directly from the Aaronic tribe part of Levi. And the Levites came from all the rest of the descendants of that Levite tribe. So there was like within the tribe, there was a delineation. Uh, and it was not a question of what you wanted to do with your life. It just was what it is. If you're born into the Aaronic part of that tribe you're going to be a priest that's it nobody's going to ask you what do you want to do when you grow up it's just that's what it is and if you're not well you're going to be a levite and you're going to have other duties in the temple each had each served god but they had different duties the priests only went into to the court of the priests of course and that's why there were priests that did everything they had every single trade was covered but there were priests who learned every single trade because nobody could go past uh, nobody could go into that court of the priests or further except the priests. <clears throat> the Levites were like the bouncers of the temple. Uh, and so they made sure that all security was taken care of there. They made sure that people did not go where they were not supposed to go. Uh, because as we talked about last week, there were very specific places where people are allowed to go. Like the court of the Gentiles, anybody could go. The court of the women, already the Gentiles could not go there. Only Ritually, pure, uh, ritually purified Jews could go there, and then so on and so forth. And there was the next one, and the next the, the court of Israel, and then they eventually get to the court of the priests, and that's it. Only priests could go there. So they had to have priests who were plumbers and who were carpenters and who were goldsmiths and who were, you know, everything, because only they could go there. So that's the way that they did it. Um, so this was a purely hereditary thing. It wasn't like you were born into the tribe, uh, the, the Levite tribe, and somebody asked you, well, do you want to be a priest when you grow up, or do you want to be a bouncer at the temple? And so it wasn't a question. You were going to do what your dad did, what your grandfather did, what your great-grandfather did, and so on and so forth, all the way back to Levi uh, and Aaron. Okay, so that's the that's the tribe of Levi. So the Levites, I thought this was interesting. I didn't know this about how they divided up the work, that there were 24 teams, and each team served two weeks in the year. Right, not back to back weeks, but they went there twice. Now, we may think that, you know, those people are old fashioned. They don't really know how to tell time. They don't even know what a month is. There's 52 weeks in a year. They were quite aware of that. <laughs> they understood that. So it's pretty clear, I think, from the context. And I'll try to find this out 100%, but I, I believe this is the case. Those other four weeks, those were covered by the pilgrimage feasts. Right. Remember, there were the, the feasts that all Jewish men were required to go to as long as they were not falling into some category of like very old or very young or whatever. And so everybody went for those Pentecost, Tabernacles uh, and the, the one of the lights. I forgot exactly what it's called. And um, I'll Hanukkah. Think. Hanukkah actually wasn't a pilgrimage feast. It's a minor Jewish holiday. It's like in the West, it became this huge thing. Yeah, Even have Adam Sandler singing about this. But it's it's uh, really a very minor Jewish feast. Um, so Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and and Pentecost, which I forgot what they call it, Sakut or something like that. Anyway, those were the pilgrimage feasts, and everybody, Levites and priests, all had to be there. Imagine ten thousand priests were there. I mean, it's bad enough to have one priest in your parish. So, um, but anyway, everybody had to go there and participate. So that's how they got to 52 weeks, is because of those <laughs> pilgrimage feasts also. Um, it, we may be fading out a little bit here. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. good. Good, good, good. All right, so uh, everyone served one week twice per year. So they were divided into 24, 24 teams. Uh, about 10,000 total people who were Levites. Uh, and they did everything from security to musician to musicians to being to being like whatever was needed in the temple outside of the priests 
they did. Um, so that I think that's going to be interesting to me. And they also had four teams and also had the, uh, the one week twice a year, and they had to come for all the pilgrimage. It actually doesn't say that the Levites did, but I think that they did. It, it makes perfect sense because what are they going to do for four weeks have no security at the temple it doesn't make any sense so they, they must have done exactly the same thing as the priests <clears throat> what's interesting is that most of the feasts most of the priests were not able to support themselves based on their work in the temple so they were either farmers or they were tradesmen or they were whatever and then they just put that aside when they had their their time that they had to go to the temple so um, yeah, I think that that's that's pretty interesting. The elite, so the chief priests, did earn enough from the temple to support themselves. Um, the high priest was ele elected annually on a rotating basis. She doesn't mention this. Probably it's later in the book, but from any of the priests, the high priest could be elected, but was generally elected from the chief priests. There was, for instance. Zachariah, who was the father of St. John the Baptist. He was a priest, right? We hear about how he received a vision when he was in uh, in the temple at the altar of incense, which was inside the tabernacle, like that was almost to the Holy of Holies. He was doing his job there. <clears throat> uh, and then we read again about how he was elected the high priest later that year that the mother of God was brought to the temple because he as the high priest brought her into the Holy of Holies. So, but he was not among the chief priests. He was not in that uh, aristocratic part of, of money. Yeah, so that's, that's very interesting. So it's obvious that you didn't have to be from those chief priests uh, in order to be chosen uh, the high priest but it looks like that most of the time happened and by the time of first century when christ came that was definitely happening so marla had her hand raised and ken sent a note with a bunch of question marks so i didn't know if that means that i was fading out or 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 no what. no no but, did i di didn't catch whether i thought you said festival of lights there's actually a festival of lots which is purim i looked up the jewish holidays no, I, I was thinking about the, what are the three required pilgrimage feasts. And I, I know that it's Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and Pentecost, but I forgot what Pentecost was called. And I thought it was called something like... Oh, Zuck Pentecost. Kippur. Okay. It's, yeah, um, I, let me... But anyway, uh, but Marla also has her hand up, and so does Lucy, actually. She just put her hand up, so why don't, uh, why don't we let one of them talk? Well, Lucy was just wondering if they did the Divine Liturgy in the Holy of Holies, or was that out in the women's court? um was that performed at that time so that's a good question uh shavut okay thank you not sakut um so there was no divine liturgy then in the old testament there was only animal sacrifice that was like the highest expression of the religion of god's people the divine liturgy so the bloodless sacrifice only comes when christ comes and he establishes the supper on Holy thursday Remember, he gives communion to the apostles for the first time. And from that day forward, they continue to celebrate the divine liturgy. And uh, those whom they ordain as priests and whom they ordained as priests and uh, bishops also continue to do that even until today. So it's like the continuation of the mystical supper. I hope that I answers see. your question. It Lucy. does. I just remember it said something about... Um... Jesus used to teach in the courtyard. He did. He taught of often. Testament. Yes, he did often teach people in the court of the Gentiles because in the court of the Gentiles, there were several parts of it, even though it was open to the sky, there were several parts of it that had roofs and they would hang out under there. And he was often teaching there. Okay. But, but the mystical supper took place away from the temple. It was not, yeah. it was in an upper room. Uh, and uh, away from the temple, although it's actually not that far from the, temp the temple. Uh, yeah, well, nothing's that far from the temple in Jerusalem, I guess. Um, it, it's definitely not a hard walk from there, but it wasn't in the temple proper. Okay. Thank good, you. Good question. Okay. So, um, so that's the priests. Um, I thought it was interesting that they had to do all of those duties and that also they had like a special 
services like we have baptisms and we have weddings and so on and so forth and people also had special kind of things that they would bring a sacrifice to the to the temple for and that the priest would do like these special uh services uh, they also were in charge of making sure that people uh, who claimed to have been healed from leprosy uh, in fact were and i don't know the reason why the priests were chosen except i think you couldn't come to the temple if you were leprous that was that made you unclean and so since they were in charge of that also i think that that's why that fell under their purview there were also physicians who were priests i mean priests who were physicians because they had to take care of the other priests there like every possible part of society priests were represented there because they had to take care of only they could go you couldn't bring in a contractor to work in in the tabernacle it had to be a priest so it, it made for a very interesting uh sort of dynamic okay we'll take a pause now any questions i know we're fading out a little bit in and out for some people i hope it's not too bad um but does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far Okay, so let's go on to the chief priests. So this was a small group of, in, of influential families. Oh yes, the priests could actually live anywhere in Israel because they only had to come to the temple a few times a year. They could, like, they could live in Galilee, although that's a that's a long walk, probably a couple of days walk, but still, they could live as in the far north. They could live where it didn't matter. The the sort of everyday priests, um, but the chief priests by this time, at least the time of Christ, they all lived in Judea, and it was which is where Jerusalem is. Like they all lived in close proximity uh, to the temple. And the chief priests, again, by this time, controlled every aspect of the temple. They held the keys to all of the doors. They were in charge of all the animal sales. They were in charge of all the acquisition of everything that was needed uh, for services in the temple, from gold to wine to everything. Uh, and they were in charge of the treasury too. So they had huge wealth. I mean, unestimable wealth almost because that the temple had almost inestimable wealth um, they also had to cooperate with the Romans now this is a very interesting situation if you remember from Zacchaeus Sunday we, we hear about Zacchaeus who in order to do his job which was a tax collector he had to apostatize from Judaism he had to make sacrifice to the Roman gods so the, not only were the tax collectors hated because they did the Romans bidding and, and extorted money from the people, they were hated because they were apostates. They had gone away from the true faith and they had gone to paganism. It doesn't seem that they had this re requirement for the priests, but they did have to work co closely with the Romans. The Romans trusted them to keep order, but only to the extent they did keep order, because when they didn't keep order, then they would come in and they would just kill them and put somebody else in their place. So we have to keep that in mind as we consider the actions of the chief priests uh, when they arrest, judge, crucify, and kill Christ. Um, you know, the Russian church has just sort of worked through this difficult conversation about how much do we cooperate with the governing authorities, right? During the Soviet times, this was a big question. It was a question before, but the even though the imperial government had a lot of influence on the church. Ideally, it was an influence that was um, not malicious, but was su supposed to be good. Whether it was or not, we'll leave that for another day and, and to discuss. But during the Soviet times, uh, it was clear that the government was not inclined nicely to the church. And how should the church deal with that? In fact, this is exactly what's happening in first century Palestine. The Roman government was not particularly well inclined to Judaism. They didn't. They weren't looking to destroy it, but they weren't Jews. They were pagans. Uh, what they wanted out of these priests was that keep the people quiet and keep the keep the money flowing. Um, so it's not that different than the conversation about what happened during the Soviet times, which is kind of still going on. Although I think we've more or less solved it. I just found that uh, that parallel very interesting. Okay, now we get to the elders. So the elders are an interesting uh, kind of group of people. It's not a hereditary thing like uh, being a priest or a Levite. These are people who were not priests, 
They were wealthy and influential, which in those days they were landowners. I mean, that's where wealth essentially came from uh, in, in the ancient world, if you were a landowner. Uh, and they were a sort of secular arist aristocracy within the Jewish theocracy. Remember, even though we had the Romans over the whole thing, what was happening underneath was a theocracy. It wasn't a democracy. It wasn't uh, a monarchy. It was a theocracy. What does that mean? It means that the government is run by the religious authorities. Right. That's the highest governing structure. In our days, uh, a country like Iran is a theocracy. Right. The people who run Iran are the are the clergy. So this is this is the same kind of government that. Uh, was uh, in the first century of Palestine. The Romans were controlling over that, but underneath that, it was the same theocracy that they had always had, which means the priests were uh, were in charge of the government. Uh, there wasn't a separate class. And then you have these elders who are like not priests, but who are part of the Sanhedrin. The most famous one is Joseph of Arimathea, uh, the Blago Obraz Yosef, or as is sometimes translated from Slavonic, the good-looking Joseph, which is not a very good translation. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> In any case, uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, was the best known uh, to us of who was an elder. So he was part of the Sanhedrin. Uh, Nicodemus also Nicodemus, is yeah. the other one that we, that we know of. Um, good. How do we translate the Blago Brazny into English? I have a mental block now. It's not good looking. Noble. Noble, that's right. Okay, so that's the elders. Then we get to the, the part of the chapter where she talks about, the, about corruption in the chief priests. And I think this is very interesting. Uh, this is often a problem in a theocracy. It's just the, the way that it is. It's often a problem. Power, prestige, and money are very dangerous in all aspects of life. It's very hard for someone to stay on the straight and narrow when they have a lot of power, a lot of prestige, and a lot of money. Uh, that's why the church doesn't have a political party, uh, and we don't pretend that the political parties align with uh, our, our moral values. Um, sometimes there's some alignment, but there is no uh, uh, political party. The, the, the church's only political party is Christ, uh, and when we understand that, then we're fine. But here we have people with a lot of power, prestige, and money, and they also happen to be the spiritual authorities. So it, it's very dangerous. Uh, yeah. as, as Lord Acton said 19 centuries later, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that was true then, even though he said that 1900 years later. So the way that this played out is that the chief priests stole the wages, the hides, the, everything from the, from the simple priests. And the simple priests, by the time of the first century in Palestine, when Christ came, were extraordinarily impoverished because of this. So whether that was true <clears throat> in the earlier temple period, <clears throat> excuse me, or that was true even 100 years before, I don't know. But I can tell you that it was true then that there was a huge dichotomy between and the, the sort of simple priests who were fulfilling the role in the temple. And as she noted, some of the simple priests literally even starved due to the greed of the chief priests. So that's a good um, that's a good sort of lesson, I think, uh, for us uh, to, to remember that power, prestige, and money uh, can be very corrupting, and we have to really be careful about that, especially in the religious life. That's true always. Uh, but especially in the religious life, we have to be careful about that. And I know that our, our bishops are very uh, um, conscious of that. Uh, because th I would say, when, when we talk about the chief priests, that's probably more aligning with our what we would have as our bishops today. Not not the attitude of starving the other priests. That's not what I mean. But I mean, like, you can't have a hierarchy. They had a hierarchy. Um, the, for instance, the bishop wears bells on his vestments, priests don't, the bishop does, because the high priest did. That's taken right from the high priest's, the vestments, the vestments of the high priest. So the, the bishops correspond 
Some sometimes we talk about them as like the image of Christ in the in the diocese, but some of their liturgical actions are taken right from the from the actions and the the rules regarding the high priest in Judaism. Paula has a question. In Catholicism, the Pope is the vicary of Christ. That's how it's called. Right. So in Catholicism, the Christ, the 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 Pope is the vicar of Christ. We don't have such a thing in Orthodox Christianity. We just have bishops. Now, sometimes they are, it depends. Sometimes we call them like they are the symbol of Christ among his people. They're really the apostles. They are the successors of the apostles. So that's, from the church's point of view, that's what a bishop is. A bishop has apostolic power, uh, but all of them are the same in the Orthodox Church. There is no like super essential bishop like we have in the Catholic Church. So that's the main actually di differentiating uh, issue between Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism. From that, many things have sprung, but that's the main difference. Okay, so um, that's kind of the chapter. The other thing that I thought was interesting was how she finished the uh the chapter and maybe this will be a, something that we can discuss if you'd like to do that so i'll quote directly jesus directly challenged the greed and abuse of power by temple authorities and their misuse of the temple for personal profit. the stand he took against the greed and corruption of the chief priests on the temple mount itself the very center of their power would lead directly to his death so christ challenged them he challenged a lot of people, uh, I would argue that the gospel, well, it's not, doesn't matter what I think, the church teaches that the gospel is for the people who lived then and for the people who live now and for everyone who will ever live. So Christ challenges us. So what place does challenge have in our lives? Or should we be challenged in our faith or should our faith facilitate a kind of quiet, calm status quo where we are not asked to grow, but to embrace comfort and to not change? So I wonder what people think about that, because I think that's kind of an important thing. Um, I'll tell you what they taught us in seminary after we have a conversation about that. So does anyone have thoughts about that? Should we be challenged? Or was the challenge that Christ uh, brought to the Jews and the people of his time just for them? And we're off the hook. We get to live fat and happy and not change. I think the challenge is it's something that we face every day. Uh, I mean, we we try to be perfect. I'm not really perfect, but should be then uh, Christian. But it is a challenge, and it's a challenge that you have. The minute you wake up, when you say, "Oh, I don't have to listen to this prayer." So, um, let me check my email. Mm -hmm. That's me. Let me check Facebook. Right. Check Facebook or email and, rather than say prayers. Yeah. You know, then it's either you finally do it or you don't. Uh, but right. it's a challenge. I would love to gossip about everybody, especially my family. Uh, but it's a challenge because, I mean, who am I to judge? Look at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we do have a lot of challenges in our lives. I think, um, oh, wait, Linda wants to say something, so I'll, I'll, I'll refrain. Go ahead, Linda. Well, talking about the greed, um, I always think of the, the, in the Bible, where they're talking about the poor woman who, who gave her last coins to the contribution, and she was chastised for such a meager you know, contribution. And Jesus said, well, you know, she's given more than you could ever think. And when I think of right. myself and trying to give that, I always think, can I give mm -hmm. more, you know, because you have to, you have to manage your house, you have to manage your family, but am I giving everything that I possibly can? You know, that's, yeah, and I think where that, is that? I think that's clearly, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linda. No, no, I, I cut you off. I'd like to hear what you had to say. Well, I, I just think, you know, where where I always question myself, where where is greed in me? Where is that point? You know, and 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 that's I it, you know, it's always 
tribulate, you know, turbulence, you know, in a way mm -hmm. that, you know, you want to do more and you, you, you're, you're stuck, you're unsure. Right. So Linda had mentioned about the woman who gave the two mites uh, that she threw in. Christ said, you know, don't don't make fun of her. She she gave everything that she yeah, had. She had yeah. That happened, by the way, in the women's court. That that's where it happened. That's where the that's where the treasury was. That's what he was, and he was watching her and commenting on that in the temple. Uh, so that's that's good that Linda brought that up. It's very thematic to our discussion. Uh, but always, and she was talking about how do we challenge ourselves so that we don't become greedy? You know, how, how do we challenge ourselves to be more like that woman? I think this is a really good example of how the gospel was written for the people who were there, but also for us. You know, like it's it's for everyone who will ever live, who will hear it, they will be able to take something good from that. Marlene, how about challenge? Yeah, uh, well, this particular paragraph to me strikes a chord in, in the, like the political arena. How are we as Christians to challenge things that are going on in the political arena, whether it be, you know, one party or the other. Um, Jesus directly challenged some of that, you know, we were talking about abuse of power and, and, and greed. We can relate it to exactly what's going on with our political system right now. How, you know, we as Christians, should we speak out on that? Should we just pray and keep to ourselves or or what so marlene's question for the ladies who are here was when we talk when we're talking about greed and about how christ challenged the ruling authorities um for their greed should we be speaking out about that in relation to the political situation that we have now and so the church as i said doesn't have a party and so i don't want us to kind of um yeah. Uh, sort of put ourselves into a specific place saying, you know, like Kamala Harris is the greatest thing ever or Donald Trump is the greatest thing ever. I, I, that's not really, that's not what the church, that's not where the church comes from. Uh, that being said, although we don't have a party, we do have moral stances. And I think that we have to kind of decide between good and bad. Because that's that's the simple choice. We like to think that that's the way life is, black and white, good and bad. But really, what it's mostly is bad or worse. Like, what, which, the, which, which is the least worst choice when we're when we're trying to make such a decision? But whether uh, as for speaking out, I think it's good for us to speak out. But it has to be done in a way that we aren't kind of casting pearls before swine. To to take a quote from the from the gospel. It shouldn't just be like random noises or words to people for whom it means nothing. Uh, I think that our, our conversations should be about morally informing and trying to lead and help others. And so for the people that we can have an impact on, I think that we have the responsibility to, to have those conversations. And for the people that we will have no impact on, it's better to just pray because we're t talking to folks uh, that we don't have that kind of a close relationship with, it's going to more likely end up with arguments than it is, you know, with a lot of a lot of heat, but not a lot of light. And I think these conversations should be focused on light to try to bring light uh, and to try to raise people to a higher moral place. So, yeah, I think we have a responsibility to speak out, but I think we have to be wise as a serpent and, and harmless as a dove in, in this kind of thing. And that's the way the church has generally talked about politics. We understand that it's a dirty business uh, and or as my father always said, you can tell a politician is lying if his lips are moving. I mean, I, I think that we really have to um, try to be wise in, in this regard. And we have to pray a lot uh, because, <clears throat> you know, in monarchical systems, the people would pray a lot that the Lord would send them a, a good monarch. And in, I guess, in theocratic systems, you should pray that the Lord will send a good, good high priest and in the democratic system we have to pray twice as much because there's at least two 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 groups from which we can be taking leaders uh and so i think a lot of prayer probably not too much talking but it's good for us to speak out to people who can hear it and for whom we will make a difference so i hope that's helpful mm -hmm. good any other th thoughts about challenge 
So we were taught that we should challenge. I mean, as priests, we're part of what we're supposed to do is challenge. Like it was made very clear to me uh, the first year I was in seminary. If everybody likes you all the time, you're not doing your job. And if everybody hates you all the time, you're also not doing your job. Right, so we we have to find a happy medium where the priest is leading the people, it, but challenging, right? So trying to help people grow in their faith, um, and so I think that it's important for people to know that because sometimes people are like, "Why is he bothering us? Like, just leave us alone, you know? We just want to eat steak on Wednesdays and not have anybody talk to us about that." Well, that's I mean that's that would be lovely, but that's that's not the way that that it works, or at least that's not the way that we were taught. We shouldn't just challenge for the sake of challenge but we have to help people to try to grow to strive because orthodox christianity really if you boil it right down is not about us trying to drag god down to the street and turn him into you know anthropomorphizing i have to say these big words because i you know i got a university degree and if i don't my parents will be sad if i don't use them but to, 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 to try to humanize him in the way of making him uh just like us but that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to try to ri rise ourselves. We're supposed to strive to go higher towards him. Uh, and ideally, that's what a priest is doing, is trying to, uh, as part of part of his work, that's not the only part, but part of his work should be challenging people to try to rise closer to God. So anyway, I thought that that would be an important thing to point out today. And I hope that it's useful. Um, I have said everything that I was prepared to say. It doesn't mean I couldn't say more or just talk ad nauseum, but that's probably not useful. I wonder if folks have any other questions about what we've read so far in the entire book. We can we can cover anything that you'd like to talk about. Um, I know that some folks are reading ahead, and that's fine. There's not, nothing wrong with that. I'm forcing myself to not do that. That hasn't been too hard because I've been on the road a lot, but um, when I've listened to the whole thing once too. So, But I wonder if folks have any anything else they'd like to talk about before we say good evening and pray. Okay, so I'm gonna take that silence as acquiescence, that we're done, and that's fine. Um, this was a shorter chapter. I didn't look at the next one. Is it, is it short or long? It's gonna be like that. Some of our chapters are long, some are super short. That's fine. And sometimes when they're shorter, maybe our meeting won't be quite an hour. And that's okay, too. Uh, as I used to say when I worked at the university, we give you back the gift of time, which, you know, is something. So let's pray, uh, and we'll say good night. I'll post the video probably tomorrow. Uh, it'll process sometime in the middle of the night. And I'll try to send out the study notes at the same time. So for next week, chapter seven. It is truly an to bless the Othello, who sent her blessed and most like blessed mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim. Who without corruption gave his birth to God the word, the very theotokos theo we magnify. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. See you next week. Thank, thank you, Father Gerger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, oh yeah, we sure have done that. Well, we have five minutes, but we can do it here anyway. We're here. Right. We're trying to be good.
Um, there we go. Yeah, so um, choosing by lot means to choose randomly. Okay. 